Breaches and cybersecurity incidents are making headlines every day. What are you doing to be prepared? Welcome to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast, brought to you by Tripwire, the show that explores cybersecurity for the enterprise and how to identify and protect against cyber threats before they happen. Listen for techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. Now, here's your host, Tim Erlen. Welcome, everyone, to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. I'm Tim Erlen, Vice President of Product Management and Strategy at Tripwire. And today, we are here to spend a little bit of time talking about facial recognition uh, technologies and use cases. I am joined today by a couple of esteemed guests, uh, and I'll have them introduce themselves. We'll start with Tom. Tom, if you want to introduce yourself, please. Uh, hello again, Tim. Uh, my name is uh, Tom Langford. Uh, I am the director of TL2 Security and a recovering CISO. And Paul, how about you? Yeah, hi, Tim. Um, my name's Paul Eden. I'm the senior director for technical services for the EMEA part of Tripwire. Excellent. So as I said, uh, we're here to talk about facial recognition. And the reason for having this conversation, the reason it's timely, is that we've seen uh, really the technology and the adoption of facial recognition starting to take off. Um, it used to be sort of a, a potential uh, technology, a potential use cases around the world. Um, but we're really starting to see adoption of facial recognition in um, actually deployed real world scenarios. And at the same time, we're starting to see pushback from local governments and activists against facial recognition being adopted as a, as a, a technology in a number of use cases. So it seemed like a good time to, to talk about it. And uh, we're setting this up as a little bit of a, a debate. So um, we've positioned Tom as, as being generally against facial recognition with some reservations, and Paul as being generally for facial recognition also with some reservations. So um, neither of, of the two are taking extreme positions, but we really did want to foster a, a debate that, that shows both sides of the, the conversation, if you will. And it would be a pretty dull podcast if we all just agreed with each other. Yes. I, yeah, we've recorded one where we all agree and, and we decided not to publish yeah. that one. It's terrible. <laughs> uh, but why don't we start with just a, a little bit of conversation around the use cases that we're starting to see in the real world for facial recognition. Um, Tom or Paul, uh, what jumps out at you as, as recent uh, scenarios where you've seen facial recognition put in place as a real world technology? So before we jump into that, can we just um, highlight the fact that facial recognition is used in two main areas, verification and identification, and they are both very different. Obviously, verification is more the type of thing you do on your phone or your iPad, where it's just comparing um, your biometric data against biometric data that it holds for you personally on that device. Um, so verification, not such a big issue. Um, identification, on the other hand, is where it's maybe taking live pictures of people, it's creating the biometric data, and then it's checking it against a huge database of data and I think that's where most of the challenges come from or most of the argument comes from. Yeah, I, I, I do agree with that because, you know, my opening gambit was going to be that, you know, facial recognition is there. It's out, you know, Pandora's box is opened. It's there. It ain't going away. Uh, it's about how it's implemented. And as, as you say, the difference between verification and identification Yes, uh, I mean it's on my phone, it's on my iPad, and I frankly I think it's it's really very good and it's great fun when I use the emojis so I can send stupid messages, you know, of a unicorn, um, you know, giving somebody giving one of my best friends a uh, a bit of a roasting because it's it looks funny when I when the unicorn swears, but <clears throat> I think um, the key thing for me though is how that data is handled and it's handled on the device. And that device belongs to me. And uh, as a consumer, I trust, in inverted commas, Apple to ensure that that data remains on that device and within my control. What the, the challenge for me is that if Apple's um, ethos changes and they start selling that data to governments, then it can then subsequently be used for identification potentially. Um, you know, technology aside, you know, quite how, you know, the scatter uh, thingy that it uses to 
to 3D map your face, etc. But it could potentially be used. And so for me, the key thing is is less about the distinction between what it is currently used for, but rather that what it could be used for. Uh, and I would I would agree, and I'd say that. So for me, the issue isn't about the facial recognition technology, the fact that it exists. Um, it's more about um, the holder of the data. So it's more about, you know, as you said, the data that's on your phone belongs to you. Um, Apple don't harvest it, or we hope they don't, and it doesn't go anywhere else. So you're in control of it, you own it. Um, I think most people's concerns are around government ownership um, and private company ownership because, you know, um, governments have uh, proved to us time and time again that they're not really trustworthy and so have private organizations. Well, and they change hands. Exactly. Well, yeah, I, I think Apple is, is a terrible example in this case because they're one of the few companies that you don't have to, technology companies especially, that you don't have to worry about uh, about them getting acquired by someone who changes their their sort of core ethos, if you will. But if you think about a, a smaller company, you know, a startup that produces an app that uses facial recognition that, that gathers that data, then you have a whole different problem because regardless of what they lay out as their initial terms and services, the potential for that to change uh, certainly exists in a, in a world of acquisitions, right? It, it does. It does. But that's less of an issue as long as the environment in which they operate is managed properly so for instance you know regulation might come in about you know uh, about how how that data can be managed and processed and sold on etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's largely in the hands of the governments and the governments are the things that change probably even more frequently you know every four to five years you know hopefully uh, very quickly in some countries um but um you know it's it, the 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 fact that a government could, in the space of a decade or two, or even even less, go from a, you know, actually a um, a very sort of uh, how can I put it, population sensitive, looking for human rights, looking at the the you know the integrity of our business, etc., to an almost totalitarian environment where you know big government and the ownership of of uh, data relating to its citizens and deciding to use that for whatever nefarious purposes that can happen i think a lot more quickly and is a lot more um difficult to combat than a company being acquired and actually the general population going you know what we don't like what that company does we're going to vote with our feet i'd agree but i would say that that regulation in some areas is already in place so GDPR covers um, facial recognition. So, you know, it's biometric data. It's covered under the principles of transparency and the um, privacy by design and privacy by default. So bio biometric data is classed as special category in GDPR. And that means that it's generally prohibited um, in the absence of Cons direct consent and di or direct legal grounds, i.e. legal obligation or public interest. Um, public interest obviously includes anti-terrorism and stuff like that. But, you know, I think there is already regulation in place. We just need to um, make sure that that regulation is similarly available across the globe as opposed to just in maybe Europe or just in the US. Right. Re regulation is necessarily geographically limited. And there are a number of places around the world where that regulation, GDPR, might not apply or could be difficult to apply. And there are certainly countries where, you know, data privacy is handled very differently from the European Union. But those countries, those those regions will never comply, no matter what regulation you put in place. Um you know, and, and let's let's just consider China. There is nothing that we can say or do um, which is going to make them comply with something that goes against um, their government. You know, if their government are using it um, to gain further power over their citizens, then they will continue to do that regardless. So the 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 compromise of your biometric data, in this case, your your 
you know, the facial uh, recognition is is just something you have to accept if you're going to travel to to China effectively. Well, yeah, you elect to, to 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 travel somewhere. It's up to you to do that. Absolutely, and you have to be in the same way that uh, uh, you know I have to get a visa to go to China or certain other countries, and I have to get certain shots. And I have to use their money, and I have to use their transport systems. I can't can't take my own trains over there, and I, you know. Um, and if I take my car over there, I have to, you know, subscribe to their laws. So yeah, absolutely, you 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 have to accept what they do in that country. Well, I, I'm just thinking about that because there are cases where, as a world, we don't accept certain practices, and we we actively fight against them at a, on a global level, and. Um, until you know, it the becomes convenient of, not to. I suppose. I, you know, big and, and you know, um we talk you know, we talk about regulation is in place, you know, for Europeans, etc. around the world, except in countries where they don't like it. Uh what happens in twenty five years when uh you know the, the 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 political spectrum in Europe has changed to the point where actually we're striking out GDPR because, you know, the terrorist threat from whomever you know, whomever is the next terrorist threat is so great. We have to have facial recognition and, you know, drone surveillance, and we have to keep records of everybody just, in, you know, in order to 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 f- fight the good fight against this, um, you know, unified threat or whatever. Things change on a regular basis. But But that would fit within current regulation anyway, because that would come under the public interest. So... My my concern is more around um, because I I'm a strong believer that our law enforcement agencies um, and our equivalent of the uh, Secret Service and people like that um, you know they need to have this airports is a perfect example as well immigration you need to have this available if we were to take that away from immigration and the police um, and the military then we're opening ourselves up to those threats from, you know, um, known terrorists who can just walk through airports because the only way we've got of spotting them is a huge, um, a, a, a huge board with loads and loads of photographs on that we're trying to identify them against as opposed to facial recognition, which does it in seconds. It's yeah, like a so... really serious game of guess who. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Yeah, but I, I think... Paul, what you're what you're describing is is a use case for uh, facial recognition for identification that um, where we're already using it, you know, facial Correct. recognition for identification through that that board of photos and just automating that process, right? Yeah, but I'm not what I'm not for is private companies or private organisations or you know those uh, even government organisations that are not as far as I'm concerned, and not using it for the right reason. If you're using it to defend or protect the pub, the public, that's fine. But if you're using it for anything else, um, then I think that needs to go through a very strict um, review process. To... But who, who defines that it's for the right reasons? So... And... G- and, and and it's the it's the individual countries and the and the governments or even the groups of countries in the case of the EU, the individual countries who and, and the and the governments that they have in at the time. No, I don't agree. Um, GDPR is in place at the moment, and that would prevent that from happening because it it doesn't allow you to use personal information um, without that person's. Um, Authorization. That's, that's only in effect because Europe says it's in effect. If Europe says it's no longer in effect, it's gone. Well, that's true, but you can't. It doesn't matter what regulation you put in place; somebody can always override yeah, it. That's my point. That's my point, and and that's so, the, the point. We have to be careful of the fact that actually, the people who define what is a good use and what is a bad use um, are not the people who. Own, wh- whose faces are involved, if you see what I mean. Well, it shouldn't um, be the government, that's for certain. It should be an independent organisation. Appointed by the government. But I, you know, it's... <laughs> well, let me, let me clarify what you're getting at, Tom, because I, I think your point is that whatever regulation you put in place, there is the potential for that regulation to change when the government changes. Yes. 
So yes. what's the alternative? Is it that we ban the use of facial recognition entirely, that we, we don't use the technology? Or is there an alternative that provides some level of, of, of you know, appropriate use without government regulation being the, the enforcement mechanism? I, I don't think there is an alternative. I, and I, you know, I, I, what I think there is, uh, and I think the key part of this is, is actually people understanding what those long-term implications are. So this whole thing of, you know, I've got nothing to hide, therefore I've got nothing to worry about, etc. It doesn't take into account any, you know, false positives or things like that. You know, when you're having the, the soles of your feet beaten with a hose pipe, but just because you happen to look like, uh, you know, somebody somebody else, um, you know, depending upon the, 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 the type of country you live in. Um, <clears throat> and I think I, I'll give you a... a, a not a facial recognition example, but a sim very similar situation. The uh, Currently in the UK, the National Health Service test and trace system actually went live today. So you download an app, you put in your details, and it tells you if you've come into contact with somebody. Now, according to the, the, the um, privacy statements from that, the data harvest is from, from some of this stuff is going to be kept by the government for 20 years. Uh, you know, in order for future study, um, for you know, for the for the purposes of trying to uh, combat future pandemics, twenty years. Who knows what's going to happen with that data? If, as I keep saying, you know, uh, government changes, and that data could be utilised uh, against people or to, um, you know, to um, what's the phrase I'm looking for to. Not segregate, uh, but to but to persecute certain portions mm -hmm. of the you know of the population and things like that. These, these are this is why we need to be aware of these issues rather than simply saying, "Oh, we just have to do it." Well, and I think I think the fact that you have nothing to hide today, to your point, Tom, doesn't mean that in the future, given a significant change in the government, you might not have something to hide then. Yeah. And if your biometric data is on file, so to speak, it could be used in ways that, that the current government wouldn't think of doing. Yeah, but absolutely. Might, might be a problem. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that the data you were talking about um, is completely anonymized, though, isn't it? There is no way to get back to an individual's um, information. It's all... Uh, it's it's used for analysis, but the analysis is not about individuals. It's about um, activities that occur over time. But we'll see what happens when that data is combined with other data that is gathered. You know, uh, <clears throat> like I said, it's this is an it's a bit like Thanos. It's an inevitability, but we need to be aware of what it is that we are allowing ourselves to be subjected to. Um, you know, I let's face it. I'm 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 a balding, overweight, middle-aged white guy. Chances are, in the next twenty-five years, I'm probably not going to have much to worry about with changing governments. You know, there are certain ethnic and religious groups in this world that are quite possibly going to have things to worry about as a result of, you know, where they happen to be born or brought up or which religion they've adopted, um, you know, or the style of dress that they wear, etc. Those things are very real threats for a lot of people. And we're seeing this in, in certain countries now. I don't wish to over politicize this, I, you know, but, um, you know, it, it's happening where people are being um, persecuted based on, you know, personal characteristics. Well, yeah. Um, and a good example of that would be China. Um, so you said it, not me. No, China. I, I, <laughs> but uh, and we, I think everyone's every, everyone's aware. And like we said, you can't control, you know, same, you know, North Korea. You're not going to be able to control what they do and what they don't do as much as we'd like to think we can. But I think one of the big things that uh, I think is missing at the moment is there is an awful lot of media hype around this, and it's I, I would say 99% negative. You know, and that's that's just typical of the media of the day. And I think what the public really need is some education in use cases, as we said earlier, for, for this. Because they, I don't think most of the public realise that facial recognition software is used in things like hospitals to diagnose people with rare genetic diseases like Dye-George syndrome. Um, it's used to enable blind people to communicate um, because it detects 
uh, a person's facial expressions so they can tell whether you're smiling at them or frowning at them, which, you know, to us is just natural. But to somebody who's blind, that makes a big difference when they're communicating with somebody if they can if they know what that expression is. Uh, so, so they get visual cues like they're either very annoyed at you or they have constipation. Yeah, they're 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 upset. Run or yeah, exactly. you know, um, no, not that way. The other way. <laughs> it's um, but there are so many different ca use cases for this which aren't you know that the public are not aware of. That if you do like, uh, I mean, Oregon, where they've I believe they've banned it completely. Um, you know, it's it's going to have a huge impact on both the security of Oregon and some of the public, you know, uh, hospital usage, you know, the blind people, as I said, but it's used in a lot of um, a lot of other cases. I mean, they've had a lot of uh, problems recently, um, we know, with um, with violence on the streets. And I'm pretty sure that up until the ban, Facial recognition would have been extremely useful and was probably used to identify some of the people that were causing the problem. What people are scared of, like you said, is the fact that it's used to identify people and it can and it can make mistakes. It, it can identify the wrong person. And that's true. But come on, let's let's be realistic. It's not the only thing you use. It goes along with the other toolboxes, uh, other tools in your toolbox, like fingerprints, witnesses, DNA. You know, you don't just uh, or at least we don't in this country and in the US. You don't just arrest people, put them in prison because you've got a photograph of them. Um, you need evidence. And this is just forms one piece of the evidence jigsaw. Have you read some of the media recently? <laughs> um, but I, I, I mean, I. Yeah. Yes, um, I think you know. It, it reminds me of, of of an article I read that talked about how um, society rails against new technology, and how actually the same arguments are brought out time after time after time. So um, the same arguments th that were given. Th so things like, uh, if we go back a while, things like it's going to rot the brain, it's going to cause laziness, it's going to cause um, you know, people to, um, you know, to, to, to become mindless and to lose their imaginations. Those are the arguments that were leveled against books when books started to become, you know, uh, introduced into schools, you know, over pieces of slate, for instance. Um, then the same thing was leveled against uh, cinema when, you know, cin cinema foot films started to come out. And then the same thing against rock and roll music, um, video games in the 80s. Pocket uh, social... calculators. Yeah, absolutely. 5G masts now. Uh, don't get me started. Um, and, um, you know, uh, social media. All, everything, all of this technology, they actually, when you look at, when you compare statements that are made about them over time, they all focus on, on, uh, appealing against our base fears and are based upon a lack of knowledge, etc., etc. Facial recognition could be a very, very positive thing, um, you know. And it's you know, technology when it's used right is a massive enabler of people. It can it can increase productivity. It can increase um, you know, uh, it can increase your leisure time versus the amount of time you work. It can increase your your well being. Um, you can, you know, when used properly, but you can only use it properly when it is managed, when people understand what it is and can actually mold the society they live in to in, in in such a way that it is managed properly if people just willingly accept it for what it is and go oh someone else is going to be looking after that that's when we come into the sort of dangers that i was alluding to earlier on yeah, and i'd agree it's up to our society to set clear boundaries that will enhance the positives and control the negatives of, of any new technology um but Not us as individuals, yeah. Well, society is a group of individuals. Yes. But at the end yeah, of the day, yeah, yeah. we elect people to do this, to make these decisions on our behalf. And unfortunately, you know, as Lord Acton said many years ago, absolute power corrupts absolutely. We need the checks and balances. 
but it can't be the governments that decide what those checks and balances are because we know that they are not necessarily the most trustworthy of groups there as it as individuals they're probably very trustworthy but as when they get together as a group then that trust tends to dissolve a bit you are listening to the tripwire cyber security podcast thousands of organizations rely on tripwire to serve as the core of their cyber security programs why because we detect suspicious activity before it becomes breach our systems work on site and in the cloud to find monitor and minimize a wide range of threats with deep system visibility and automated compliance we help you shorten the time it takes to catch vulnerabilities and ensure your organization is following the absolute best practices in cybersecurity today for more information visit tripwire.com that's tripwire.com But Paul, I, I mean, you, you, you're proposing, it sounds like, a, you know, some kind of non-governmental independent oversight organization. I, I just I, I don't see how it's practical, I guess, because they they would rely on the government for the ability to enforce anything they're doing anyway. Well, they rely on the legal system and the yeah. legal system is independent of government or should be. Ah, a fair point. So, you know, it's it, if you go back to GDPR, GDPR was not. Um, a, the GDPR regulations were not put together by government. It was put together by civil servants who worked for government, but they were still civil servants and they reported um, through different lines. So, and a lot of independent um, advice was was taken to put, you know, to put those regulations together. And anyone who's read it will will know that in general it is exceptionally good for the privacy of the individual. Um, it does not give a lot of leeway for governments or other organizations to abuse um, the data that they hold on individuals. And I think that's what we need. I think GDPR is a good starting point, but I think we need something focused, not specifically on, um, on facial recognition, but on biometric data. Uh, any biometric data that's held on people, and that could be fingerprints, that could be your, you know, your blood type, it could be DNA, anything, anything that's held in a biometric form needs to be managed in a specific way, and should, you know, there needs to be legislation that says um, not just what can and can't be done with it, but who can and can't do that, you know, I. I really don't like the idea of people like um, Facebook ha uh, having biometric data, holding my biometric data. Apple, I feel much more comfortable with. My government, I feel far less comfortable with. Um, but well, it's because you're going to end up with the data being left on a train somewhere. Yeah, well, that too. There's, but, a, there's a track history there. So, I, I mean, I I spent 24 years in military intelligence working for government agencies. I I know that... The actual agencies are very trustworthy. The politics that drives sometimes drives the remit of those agencies is not, um, you know. So I I, I fully expect um, the Secret Service, the police, um, some parts of the military, um, and some other go government organisations that I may not even be aware of to hold that kind of data. Um, I just hope that they hold it in a way that makes it um, impervious to attack, hacking, abuse, that kind of thing. Uh, I mean, history has demonstrated that abuse is going to happen. Uh, I mean, it's it either abuse or um, compromise through malicious attack or even compromise through incompetence. These are, these are things that are going to happen with sensitive data one way or another. So we, we better be prepared to actually deal with those incidents. And it's quite interesting that what it... What are we scared of happening? So if you look at the data types that we've got here, so you've got a, um, it always starts off with a photograph. You've got to have a photograph of somebody uh, and that's going to be in a database. That photograph is passed through um, some kind of algorithm and it comes up with a uh, biometric template. 
then you've got on the other end you've got maybe cameras or photographs or some form of digital um, data collection of uh, a picture of your face that goes through that same process creates the template and then they try and identify the individual in the database by matching the templates up uh, with a percentage of error um, so are we worried about people you know hackers getting hold of that biometric data because actually that is useless to them without the database of photographs and the matching to identity and, the, and yeah. the matching template that goes with it they can't they can't do anything with it so you know if they're picking the, if they're doing let's say um uh some kind of man in the middle attack let's say where they're collecting the data as it's coming in being transposed into a, a through the algorithm into the biometric data if they're grabbing it at that point it's of no use to them whatsoever because they need the master database um, and that's the bit that we need you know we should be looking to protect uh, I don't care about the front end I don't care if they're filming me all day it's that back end where the where the challenge the defense challenge comes in I, I mean the, the the question of abuse still stands though I think you you have situations uh, what I'm thinking about here is the the, the role that uh, third-party providers play because that ownership of the data is key and governments are not building and developing facial recognition technology th themselves. There are third-party companies that are doing that, and their goal is to make a profit. So how do you manage that relationship and avoid uh, instances of abuse when you have third parties involved in managing that data? That's really difficult. Um, I'm guessing, uh, and I'm just top of my head now, um, to me, the, the best way to do that is you um, you have a number of licensed vendors who are able to develop that solution and just like so go back 10 years encryption 256 bit encryption um, was not allowed to be exported outside of the US so the the encryption that had been created or the um, solution that had been created in the US was not allowed to be exported to um, certain countries. Sure. Um, and that was controlled. Uh, and I think you would have to do the same with this. You would have to control the the actual vendor software. So they can't, you know, they're not allowed to release it to just anyone. There are certain organizations that are allowed to use it. Um, but it would mean that it would obviously there'd be a big price tag on it with regards to those that mm. do use it um I, well so you could I think legislate that's the only way that. you can do it you can license yeah it. i mean you, you'd legislate that and you'd have to audit it um i think it, it would be challenging but you know as we saw with encryption maybe you slowed down the adoption of of you know um 256 bit and higher encryption in other countries where you didn't want it to happen, but you didn't prevent it from happening, ultimately. No, right? you that didn't. That technology does get out. And the same would be true of, of facial recognition, I would think. Yeah, absolutely, because I think that there is a commercial interest in making the very mo most out of it. And companies will, especially if they're empowered by governments to act on their behalf uh, or, some, or you know have a license to operate, companies will push those boundaries uh, or many companies will push those boundaries, um, bend the law, sometimes even break it, but but still be in a position whereby um, it it will either be overlooked or the law will will bend around them or or whatever. So I think, uh, um, like I say, it's you know the, the the cat is out of the bag. It's going to happen. Uh, we just need to be you know prepared and educated to understand what's going to you know what is possible with this data and make sure that the people who we are electing to look after this stuff are actually doing so in in our interests and not just in the interests of corporations so are we saying that now that this technology has been developed and proven that it it can work and that it exists that there's there is effectively no way of actually stopping it from no. being used you no you can you, you can yeah you can make it illegal but that won't stop it from being used um no I just mean the criminals will use it. Yeah, but 
but that's going to happen that's going to happen regardless there's nothing you can do you can't unmake you know you can't undevelop a technology um so what we have to do is just regulate to give us the best level of protection we can and that's you know it's a risk like everything in life it's a risk uh, you do a risk analysis and you come up with some form of uh, remediation um, and you hope that that gives you the protection you need and you continually review it um, and upgrade it as you go along um, I, I just don't think you know I don't think banning it works because there are so many good use cases um, that you know I think we would suffer because of it um, but there has to be regulation to prevent misuse and I think that misuse in general I think mo I think most of the public because of the stories that have been in the press over the last five ten years um, they're probably thinking of private organizations more than anything but I think it's it's both sides of the fence private and public so I think government needs to be controlled and that's done by the legislation and I think um, the private organizations need to be controlled and again that's done by regulation you are listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Well, I don't know that we've come to a, a clear conclusion, but there's certainly a lot of interesting data to look over, interesting use cases out there. I I don't think there's a I think we're I think you're right that we can't stop it from being used at this point. You know, Paul, you said you can't undevelop a technology. I mean, I I feel like I've seen vendors try and do that at times, uh, unintentionally perhaps, but um <laughs> You know, it's not going to happen. And so we have to move forward in sort of a, a risk-based, pragmatic way, um, which is a terribly boring way to conclude a, a debate. And to be fair, I think I think you two ended up agreeing for the most part. So, Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. absolutely. All right. Well, I want to thank you both, Tom and Paul, for joining us uh, on this podcast. It was uh, uh, an interesting conversation, certainly. And uh, I hope everybody who listened got, got something out of it as well. It's a, a topic that we'll... We'll continue seeing in the news and continue talking about for a long time, I think. Thanks, Tim. Yes, thank you. You have been listening to the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. Join us next time as we explore stories of people protecting people and techniques and best practices to harden your defenses against hackers. We'll talk to you next time on the Tripwire Cybersecurity Podcast. <laughs>